Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Dr. Aboon Joseph, and she's coordinator of the first Black Studies module in Ireland at University College Dublin. And today we will chat about why people in Ireland need allies, not bystanders. Hi, Aboon. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you so much for inviting me here. Well, you're very welcome here today, Aboon. And my first question for you is, where are you located and what's keeping you sane over the last few months? I'm in Dublin. I'm located in Dublin. And um, what's kept me sane? Music. Plenty of music. I tell you, Halloween weekend, I, I don't know. I mean, I have two young, two teenagers at home. So, but I suddenly just felt alone, you know. And what did I do? I started listening to all the 80s and noughties and I was dancing to all the songs. She's fresh, she's so fresh. And I was dancing. So yeah, music just keeps me going. Wonderful. That's wonderful to hear, Abun. So my second question for you today then is, you are a lecturer in the School of Education at UCD. And so can you please tell people about the research that you do as part of this role and what makes you so passionate about this? Um, so my research is really looking at the labor market. Again, you see the way our society is changing, really, really diverse. Our workplaces are diverse. So what will help people feel included? You know, there's a lot of work about diversity and inclusion, but we also find that there is massive inequality within the labor market. So I really wanted to find out that Immigration alone, people migrating has not been the key reason why there's so much inequality among groups. So what stands for that? What accounts for the inequality between groups in the labor market? And my work realized that, you know, um, it's racial stratification. So my work looks at it from the perspective of racial stratification. In other words, it's not where people end up. Our research usually looks at where people end up, but my work uses a, a stratification framework to show that it is about where people start. If you start so further back down, where you end up almost becomes inevitable. Okay, wow. That's really, uh, really interesting. And I'm sure our listeners will have a lot of questions about that today. But my next question for you is you recently stated, who controls the narrative of the past controls the narrative of the future. So maybe you'll talk a little bit about that, please. Yeah, and that is so, so important. You know, that's really where I am now trying to help people to understand how important the stories that we've told about the past. So we talk about, you know, decolonizing curriculums. We've talked about, you know, that colonial, um, inheritance that we have. So many people who are alive today, we are not born during the colonial era, yet you still find that that messaging is still carrying on. So whoever, the narratives, the way we talk about the past, the way we talk about people in the past is really the reason we are where we are today. Most of us want to change the future, but if we ch to change what is happening in the future, we need to change the stories that we're telling about people, the way we treat people, the way we position them, the way we value them, even the stratification, the strata in which we place people is really based on the stories, the narratives that we have said about them in the past. So if you want to change the future, we need to ch start from today to change the stories, the stories that we tell about people. Wow, so it's all back to the stories we tell. Okay, so um, another question, and, and in the Institute for Discovery, we are very interested in interdisciplinary research, and your background is incredibly interdisciplinary. So has this added value or a different perspective to your career? I think it's, I think that is one of the things that has helped me the most because, you know, I have a counseling background. So when I did my research, you know, so in all of my work, I'm able to approach it from a psychological perspective. I can look at the impact. So I'm not just saying this happened to people. I can look at the impact. So my psychology background, my counseling background helps me to do that. But then I also have a, a, a background in microbiology. It then means that I'm able to scientifically look at, you know, objectively, well, not so objective, but up to a point and look at data and statistics. But then I also have a, you know, a master's in adult guidance and counseling. Then that means that I'm able to bring in that aspect of me that looks at how to direct people or how to uh, 
um, help people to navigate or, you know, to look at how they um, respond to life. And then, you know, having a social justice background in my doctorate then also means I'm able to come from the angle of social justice. So really, all of those things has helped me to work in more of an eclectic way. I can go inside me and draw from that, you know, so I'm not just saying this is the, this is what happened. I'm able to look at the impact both psychologically, emotionally, but also physically to people. So that has really helped. Fantastic, Abun. So uh, we have loads of questions coming in from the audience. So please, everyone else, if, you, if you're listening, please do submit your questions and I'll try to get through as many as possible. So now, Abun, we're just going to open it up to the audience. So loads of questions coming in and some interesting ones about the impact of racism on people. So how what does it feel like this impact of racism what what does it feel like for the person who's who's uh, suffering this thanks so much for that question because i think it is really really important because people wonder why do i keep going on you know it's not like if you experience all the racism yourself why do you keep going on see we need to understand that when people experience racism racism is a shaming process it's not just, oh, you said this or you called me name. It is a shaming. It shames the human person, you know, when they experience racism. And so um, when that racism is then experienced with somebody else witnessing it, it means that people become a witness of your shame. It has both an emotional and a psychological impact. So imagine something shameful happening to you and then happening to you in a way that other people are able to witness it. That is what it is. So it's not just the physical impact you know, uh, on all of that, but also because we look at the systemic nature of racism that it impacts on the person as well, both uh, financially, economically, and, and psychologically. Wow, so, so I suppose you often talk, uh, so loads of questions coming in, so here's one, you often speak about using your privilege um, and this idea of, you know, not to be a bystander and um, uh, help the, uh, so a bystander helps the person to experience the shame. So, you know, how do we not be, uh, people of privilege, how do we not be bystanders, I suppose, is the question they're asking. Really important. If, if I go back to, you know, George Floyd's killing, really important that when people experience racism, that is, ha that, and it happens publicly, people are observing it, but, that shame is then on you because you experience racism. But if a bystander observes that, they watch your shame. But if the bystander acts, if they speak up, you know, if they use their privilege and they speak up, what happens? The shame moves from you who has been, um, who has experienced racism. It moves from you to the person who is carrying out the, 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 the racist act. So really it helps. Bystanders are really powerful. They can be powerful if they use their role. Keep safe, evaluate it before you act, but when you can use your privilege and act because it directs the shame away from the victim, it directs the shame to the perpetrator of racist acts. Okay, so um, another question along those lines, and, and you mentioned obviously George Floyd, and that's very, uh, I suppose, overt racism, but this, this, this uh, listener is asking, um, is there a more subtle racism in Ireland and, and how easy would it be for people to react to that and, and any particular one you want to highlight? There is. And I think, you know, sometimes when we look to the United States and we look to the UK, you know, where, you know, where things are more overt, we say, oh, you know, it's worse over there, you know, um, but you can see that and you can report it and you can challenge it. But here in Ireland, what we have is more of that subtle one. And we have more of that every day, what we call the systemic, more systemic racism, policies and ideas that, you know, challenges people and hinders people from being able to fulfill their you know their full potential for example you look at the labor market you look at the fact that people are qualified are underemployed my research my research shows that you know a lot of people of migrant descent are underemployed and then most of them are a lot of the black people are interviewed that i've seen most of them are actually working three levels lower that means somebody who has a a, a level 10 phd is working in a level five 
role as a care assistant. This is not hearsay. I, I know people who are in that role. So in other words, they are working five levels lower than what they are you know, qualified for. There's nothing wrong with those roles. But if that is, if you're qualified for more than that, then it is a subtle um, form of racism within our system where we favor what looks like us. So it's that more um, type of racism that we have, you know, we favor what looks like us more than um, people who appear different. So that's an interesting point that you're talking about inequality in the labor market, because I have a question here saying exactly what that you mentioned inequality in the labor market, but do you see the same problems in academia? Oh, massively. I mean, I think I just posted this morning because I saw that, you know, it was equal pay for women. I was like, but what about us black women? What about us black scholars? What we have in academia in Ireland, we only have one, one, one. I have to say that three times, you know, one female black scholar, one female black professor in the whole of Ireland. It's not because we are not qualified. It's not because there is no role. It's not because we do not have the skills or the competence. So there is a systemic um, within the within the academy. We would much rather bring us in to come and give guest lectures. My email is full of requests for guest lectures. How do I pay the bills with guest lectures? I cannot do research. I cannot build. I can. I literally cannot build my career on guest lectures. Everybody wants me to come and do guest lectures. How? You know, so that's how I call it a colonization of my skills and intellect again. So you come, you, 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 you know, we're able to give that, but we're not able to get anything back to build our careers. So it is, it is a massive, massive challenge. There is a need in there, but we would rather um, equip, you know, give it to other people, you know, even despite the fact that, you know, you have people in Ireland qualified. So yes, it is, you know, the academy is the biggest, I think we're the biggest culprits in, in all of that. So what would fix that, Aboon? So it's positions, and then obviously once the positions come, then funding for the particular type of research, so particular funding calls. Is that is that correct? I don't even think it's whether it's just the funding calls. You know, I think it's the fact that in the pipeline, people are Irish system. I, I run the Institute of Anti-Racism and uh, I run the Institute, but I also am the chairperson of the African Scholars Association. On that network, Everybody there, they have their PhDs already, and they were homegrown here in Ireland. So I'm not saying PhDs from outside. If we are raising, we're training PhD holders from of of you know diff, of migrant descent and African descent here, then we should be able to look at the pipeline to help them navigate into those roles. They are qualified for it. So I don't know if it is just you know funding call, you know. For example, in, in Ireland, we, we decided to do a black studies. Um, um, why is black studies still a, just a module? Do you know, why don't we have a lecturer in black studies? Why don't we have a professor of black studies? Yeah. You know, one of our colleges decided to do it and it's only part time, you know, for 18 months. I'm like, stop, you can't, one role, only one role, we cannot even invest to make it a full-time job. That's it. Race is a big issue. We do not have professors of race in Ireland. Colonial studies, slavery, those are all the things that are, are fun, you know, that those are all the roles that we have in the UK, in the US. We don't have such roles here in Ireland. No, we need to have them. Absolutely, I fully agree. So I have so many questions here, Aboon. So I'm gonna try my best to get through another two in the next kind of minute, and then we'll have to finish up, unfortunately, because we're really running out of time. But here's one, in teaching roles, how do we create a safe space and build up students who have previously suffered from systemic racism in their education? Um, so safe space, to create a safe space, say, it, you know, when I teach black studies, I'm teaching black studies to black and white students. So when I start, I say it, I name it. It's not the elephant in the room. I said, we need to have a safe space. This is a space where you can say what you need, you know, but we have to be, so I create it by saying it, I name it. That's number one. Number two is to make sure that, you know, everybody within the group, don't keep looking to the migrant person. Don't keep looking to the black person to be the teacher. They are not there to be 
our teachers. They are there to learn, you know, and so it's not to put pressure on them to teach us that we all, so include them because they are growing also in this our white Eurocentric um, systems, you know, going to the same education as us. So include them, say we are all, you know, bring them in together in that and let's all have that conversation. So not just looking to the black person to be the teacher. They are not our teachers. When they are in our classrooms, they are students and they too want to learn. So let's do the work, let's learn, you know, let's um, make sure that we all bring that, that skill on the table. Okay, so I'm sorry, we have actually run out of time. So last question for you, Abun. What is your advice to young people of color? Three things, you know, I, my research shows that, you know, there are those who adapt, those who collude, and those who resist. Racial stratification is real. While it is not real in its, um, in its entirety, it is real in its impact and its effect. But how do we challenge that there are those who resist? I'm asking you as a person of color, resist. Resist not by fighting, resist by building yourself, resist by refusing to give up. Resilience, I am where I am because if I tell you all of the things that have happened to me in the academy that should put me down, that should make me give up, I don't give up. I pull myself back up and I come back again to the same places where they said no to me to the same places where they resisted me i come back and i'm asking you don't give up you know just keep getting back up again keep you know if if you don't give up racial stratification cannot win racial stratification only wins when we stop and i'm asking you don't stop change the tactics change where you're going change where you're going change what you're doing but keep at it and you would win wow Wow, what a stunning way to end. Thank you so much, Abun. So unfortunately, we are completely out of time. So sincere apologies to those of you who submitted questions that I didn't get to. So I just wanted to say, uh, just take this opportunity to say an absolutely huge thank you to Abun. That was absolutely wonderful, Abun. A fascinating discussion today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your time. And thank you to everyone else for joining in. So we run the series every Tuesday so please check out zoom for thought.ie where you can uh, sign up to um, uh, reminders about our series and upcoming speakers so thank you so much again Aboon for a wonderful discussion and thanks everybody have a great day and we will see you all soon on zoom for thought thank you thank you